Hello and welcome everyone to this series of conversations that we're doing with youth change makers across countries of Asia. With us today is Danica, who works in Philippines in the area of climate governance. These conversations that we're doing with youth change makers is ahead of the Asia Youth Festival happening in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia next week, hosted by Arrow. Welcome, Danica. And uh, please tell us a bit about your work and uh, also a bit uh, maybe to start with about the particular context of uh, Philippines with regard to climate change. Thank you very much, Sumita. Yes, I'm Danica Marie Sufnet. I'm Senior Analyst for Climate Governance of the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. And uh, we are based here in Manila, in the Philippines, um, and we are working closely with um, the municipality of Kiwan, Eastern Samar, for several projects, um, such as um, the Worth um, Initiative, uh, or the planning initiative that we convened um, last 2021. So quick background of the Philippines in terms of impacts of climate change. So well, based on the current projections, um, observations of scientists and the Philippines climate scientists in the Philippines. So um, major slow onset events that we are experiencing in the Philippines include um, sea level rise, since we are an archipelago and an island community also. Um, other than that is um, increasing temperatures um, and, and of course um, prolonged rain and at some point for other um, areas in the Philippines, um, prolonged drought is also another issue and it has been um, affecting um, major sectors in the Philippines, such as the agricultural sector, the fisheries, and the major biodiversities as well, and even the urban sector. Um, we are also um, in the typhoon belt in the Southeast Asian region. That's why we are um, a frequent um, uh, landing of um, strong typhoons in the Philippines, such as of course, the typhoon Haiyan, uh, which has been a benchmark for all the studies and all the projections in terms of the frequency of typhoons here in the Philippines. So we've been we're still experiencing more typhoons, but then um, according to the projections also of our scientists, even if we will be experiencing less lesser uh, frequency of typhoons, we might also experience a more um, a more intensity or um, that in terms of damages with regards to um, the impacts of typhoon being greater in the future. So that's the case of the Philippines also. Right. Uh, and your project works on climate governance and works with uh, men, women, as well as youth. So if you could just explain a bit about your work. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question, Samita. So um, our work, we called it um, the Project Cookie Jar because <laughs> um, we, we would like to open that opportunity for integrating gender, sexual, reproductive health and rights and health um, in the climate adaptation um, planning of local governments. So for the birth initiative, um, we... Um, convened several um, workshops with um, the municipality of Kiwan in Eastern Samar um, to test whether we can integrate um, gender, sexual reproductive health and rights in the usual um, climate adaptation planning of the Philippines. Because in the Philippines, um, we have two policies. We have the climate change um, policy, um, the local climate change action plan. And um, of course, we have the gender and development planning as well. So um, most of our observation, well, the observation for many also that these policies are really uh, implemented in silo. That's why um, at the local level, it's quite difficult to um, climate tag or identify whether the programs and even the projects of local governments are uh, both responsive to climate change and also addressing um, the issues with regards to SRHR and gender. So that's the project. So we did a series of workshops, um, creative workshops, because this is also um, the niche of the Women in Earth Initiative program um, to ensure that this, there is a creative, innovative process with regards to the uh, programs that we did. So what we did is integrating the 
um, aspect of art or human or the humanities into development planning. So before we started the actual nitty gritty or the usual um, less we we or the more serious part of planning, um, we try to do it in a more um, comfortable or a more um, innovative and um, how they get interactive uh, way of planning by introducing um, the photo voice and the photo gallery activities, where we see that it is a powerful tool uh, for starting the conversation with regards to um, gender and climate change. Um, because in in G1, of course, they've been doing their, they've been crafting their climate change um, policies and plans, but then um, there's still more work that needs to be done when it comes to integrating um, gender and um, SRHR and even health in the context of climate change, because most of the um, mandated policies in the Philippines to ensure that um, there is, uh, let's say, gender balance or the issues of gender is incorporated in the policies. Usually, it's just um, ensuring that there's um, um, a gender disaggregated data as one of the requirements, but there is no, no, or there is limitation in terms of analyzing whether there's really um, a direct or indirect um, um, connection or impact with regards to these vulnerabilities as well. So that is the project. Right, so uh, if you can just tell me, like, how do the two come together? Mm -hmm. I mean, how does climate change affect uh, yeah. uh, and, you know, gender and sexual and reproductive health and rights? <laughs> Yes, with regards to that, um, usually when it comes to climate change, we're looking at the direct impact of, let's say, the sea level rise, um, temperature, typhoon, with regards to the sectors. So, for instance, in the Philippines, um, especially for small island communities, this is one of our um, usual examples also. So, for instance, small island communities are usually far from the mainland. So, they're relying on um, water from the mainland to ensure that there is um, potable water for daily household use and also for community use, uh, where for cooking, uh, for washing and washing the dishes, uh, for laundry, and even of course for, for hygiene. But because of the proximity of these islands to the, to the mainland, usually the services are not um, at par or not, um, or is limited rather. Um, when it comes to um, servicing uh, water in the community. So let's say there's a potable water system. However, it's communal. So it's shared by most of the household. So when there is sea level rise, for in the case of sea level rise, um, for some island, most rather most island communities in the Philippines, um, salt water intrusion is one of the issues that they are battling when it comes to ensuring safe water. Um, because of sea level rise, most of the sources of water are really saline, uh, which is again, you, we want to ensure that we have a clean and safe water. Um, that's servicing most of the household, but then because of the salinity, that's another issue to, that's being battled. So they need to um, go back to the mainland and fetch um, more um, uh, clean water. So they're um, so in the case of Kiwa, they are relying on um, water. Uh, what do you call this? Water districts to ensure that they would have an access to clean water, but then. Again, that's another added burden in terms of transporting water, transporting the services from and to the community. So it's affecting, of course, the daily activities of the communities, especially of women and children who are usually in the household. So it's also affecting, of course, um, their hygiene. Yes. And of course, yeah, yeah, as either. You, you can just imagine how hard it is to really get the water from the community. So in one of the islands in Giwan, um, when we visited it, the, the community there, uh, they start um, fetching water around seven o'clock in the morning. So that would not be really that hot yet. Um, so some of the, some of the um, women in the community has their own cart or their own bicycle 
so that their, the jugs of water would be placed there to ensure that they'll be able to fetch enough water that will be used for the whole day. So another burden for the women is that they're the main um, keepers of the household, especially when the men are outside to um, pursue other um, formal work. So this is, again, the issues of un unpaid care work in the community with regards to uh, climate change. And those issues, when we look at it, ah, see, sea level rise is a direct impact, but then you will see the indirect impact of sea level rise. When we look at the social realities already, the impact of it too, not only for um, the daily um, activities of the community, but also the individual health of um, women and children, not only in terms of sanitation, but also in terms of nutrition, because there's also sometimes um, malnutrition as one of the um, major um, issues also here in the Philippines. So those are the, it's like um, a domino effect, the impacts of climate change. So in another, in a flip side, if it's already, if it's already um, dry season in the Philippines. So we've been experiencing um, um, warmer, warmer temperatures up to 40 degrees, especially in the dry season around um, March to May, um, and even it's extending it to up to April. So with that flip side again, if it's already, if there is, if it's hotter than usual, of course, the sources of water is um, usually dried up. So again, the issue of access to services, access to water is another issue when it comes to that season also. Right, and uh, that's really, uh... Amazing. So what about, you know, will it have an impact on violence and sexual health as well? Yes. Um, unfortunately, when we did this project with um, Giwan, they also have a difficulty in linking it to violence, especially that, again, it would need more um, consultation and discussions with the communities and even with the law enforcement. But then this is also considered, I think it's also in their, their, their um, list of priorities when we look back at their um, list of, of priorities for the local government. So um, violence is really, um, gender violence is really one of their priorities as well. But to link it again with climate change, um, with SRHR, there's a difficulty for uh, the local government to do so. That's why there's still more um, studies that need to be done also. Right, right. So, um, uh, so do you see, you know, the workshops that you all have done and you've worked in the community, uh, how has it uh, helped raise awareness on these issues? <laughs> yeah. Um, very important because most of our activities are really country, I rather community level um, activities. So while the local, there's a separate um, uh, workshop for the local government, we made sure that there would be more community engagements um, to see um, how the concepts would be more, um, um, what do you call that? acceptable also to the community, understandable also uh, based on their um, experiences also. And uh, we want to make sure that they were really um, touching the current realities on the ground, not just based on what was said or what was written before. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we really capture what's really the sentiments of the communities. That's why um, throughout the activities, um, we made sure that there would be more engagement with the community. So we um, convened several um, workshops such as um, the rapid care analyses. Um, hope you know about the rapid care analyses. Um, in the context of climate change, of course, to ensure that we will capture the um, the gender and SRHR components and also discussing unpaid care work in the context of climate change. Right. So uh, through the work that you've done, you would have reached, you know, how big, uh, you know, the numbers of people that you would have reached through these mm -hmm. workshops. Okay. So 
Um, in terms of workshop, in terms of number, since we are working closely with local governments around um, 20 from the local government, um, from the community, perhaps um, 100, because um, there is a cascading effect also, because there are more, more barangays or community groups in the Philippines, so even in Giwan, so about 100. But then um, we are looking at the impact of the policy that was crafted that would um, really provide more for the whole given given municipality also right so um so do you see that the youth are actively engaged in this work yes they are really engaged in this work because um they were also part of the um workshops and um, the Sangguni, Sangguni Ang Kabataan, or the SK, we call it like the, um, the policy body of the, the youth in the Philippines, is really active also. And even their um, leader is also active in the discussions um, and the workshops that we did. So um, even the local government and even the community um, leaders are very supportive of um, engaging the youth when it comes to climate change discussions, when it comes to gender, sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, because they know that at the end of the day, it's for them and not for the leaders. <laughs> because at the end of the day, it would be the next generation, the youth that would be really um, leading the community when it comes to raising awareness. So, so youth is, is, is an important um, sector in the, not only in our project, but in the whole um, um, initiative of the local government as well. Right. Uh, so this is really very uh, wonderful to hear and to know about the great work that you all are doing. Uh, how do you see way forward and you know, how do you see this work that you've done on a small scale uh, go forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, currently, local governments in the Philippines are facing um, a devolution of, of um, devolution of what do you call this of policies, which means some of the functions of the national government will be transferred to the local government. So, so what's that for our project? So it means that local governments need to strengthen their planning processes, especially that they are also um, required, mandated rather, to make it um, more of a policy term, mandated to climate tag or identify um, their climate adaptation and mitigation projects, whether this is in line of infrastructure, social sector, even in line of um, environmental protection and all. So this is very important when we say that we want to see the gender and development planning and even the funding of the local governments to be used for um, climate adaptation initiatives that addresses not only the gender aspect, SRHR and health, but also it's already it's also addressing the greater um, climate change issues of the local government. So with this um, small scale um, project that we did, since there are so many movements in the Philippines when it comes to policy and planning, including the devolution of functions, um, the, the long list of programs that we uh, try to outline from based on the activities that we did was already part of the ongoing negotiations and planning of the local government which means they can now add these um, programs to their priorities as well. So that's also something that we want to see in the future, not only for G1, because they're already the part of um, implementing these programs at the local level. So even, even our workshop, our process of um, integrating the creative um, side or the inhumanities and planning is also is now part of their usual planning process. So we're really ha happy about that. These we're just expecting that it's the result that they will adopt. But 
even the process that we did in P1, um, they also adapted it as part of their planning process as well. So they're going always going to the communities, uh, using the photo voice technique and even the photo gallery to discuss the realities on the ground. So that's one thing that we're really happy about also. And um, actually, just last last night, yesterday, um, we were talking about um, going back again to D1 because um, uh, the head of the Municipal Social Welfare and Development Office of G1 would like to um, continue um, or rather convene another um, planning workshop with the local communities, but it's focused on um, strengthening the, the youth and the community in line of um, in light of the coastal protection program of, of the local government. So that's another um, exciting part or another offshoot of the small project that we did with Arrow. So aside from policy, so there are more projects in, in between that's been um, an offshoot of the small project. And we are hoping, of course, that um, with G1 as the model municipality, some of the neighboring municipalities would also follow um, in this process also. And yeah, I think- Excellent. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. Great, great. So uh, when you're you know, part of a network and a group uh, of like, you know, other people who are doing similar stuff, so like, uh, you know, uh, what kind of mentoring and support did uh, you receive from Arrow? And how did it mm -hmm. help me? Yeah. So it's a it's um, a two prong, I should say, because when when we applied for the birth initiative program, we didn't know that there's a funding opportunity. Because for ICSE, um, we were just starting our integrating gender into our programs, um, and we see the birth initiative as an opportunity for us to um, hone our skills and our knowledge when it comes to gender as our HR integrating to climate change, because that's what's lacking also from ICSC at the time. So two-pronged, as I say, because one, of course, the funding, which provided us um, seed funding to, to implement um, the small-scale um, project in D1. But the bigger opportunity for, for this project is also the mentoring, continuous mentoring actually of Arrow and continuous continuous um, community um, community of practice for learning, um, which I think um, is also the niche of Arrow providing us more information, more knowledge and SRH on climate change. They've been inviting us not after birth, they've been inviting us to several um, conversations with regards to this issue. So it's also strengthening our um, knowledge with regards to um, SRHR and gender, which we've been integrating slowly into our programs as well. So that's what um, the Arrow group has provided us, the birth initiative also. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. So, Danica, just, uh, you know, one last question on, you know, you spoke about water mm -hmm. and, you know, access to services. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so through the workshops and the community engagement that you do, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, would you have come up with, say, proposed recommendations or something? And if you can just, you know, tell me a bit more about maybe, so... When you're saying that this is an issue, this is a challenge, what uh, you know are you proposing that should be done by local governments? Hmm. So the recommendations uh, mostly didn't come from us, actually. It came from the community um, because it's what they think would be the applicable programs or projects to address these um, issues. For instance, when it comes to infrastructure, let's one of the community leader was telling us that if um, um, a potable water system that can service a one in a one to one ratio household is not possible, why not um, become more innovative? Let's say let's um, build um, possibilities of marine water harvesting for each household. 
or rainwater or rainwater har rainwater harvesting for let's say for um, the community health centers to ensure that there are al alternative ways of um, securing water sources for them. So those are one of the recommendations from the community. So it didn't came from us really. It was from the community itself. And even um, the WASH program, they are saying that it shouldn't be one of um, the projects that will only be convened or will only be um, implemented if there is a, let's say, a, a Women's Month celebration. It should be part of their planning process. Um, because for the longest time, well, Giwan um, has um, tested their resiliency for the longest time because they are the first first municipality where Typhoon Haiyan had made its landfall. So the test of resiliency was also there. And they know the impact when, when it comes to their um, resources, sorry about <coughs> resources, specifically their water. <coughs> right. Thank you, Danica. It's been uh, so wonderful uh, talking to you. And thank you for sharing about all the fabulous uh, work you all are doing. Um, for everyone listening in, this is a, a series of conversations that we are doing on impact of climate change and gender justice. And we were speaking today with Danica, who works in the, in the Philippines. And uh, for everyone uh, listening in, if you would like to know more about the Asia Youth Festival happening in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia next week, you can always tune in into the ARO website. Thank you and bye for now. Thank you very much.